In this video, we will test the concept of a robot that places parts into 3D prints automatically. After my last video, the question that was raised the most was, why don't we just use a scale to count the screws? To answer this question, we will take a look at the advantages of a feeding system with proper orientation. Because I like to demonstrate things and not only explain them in words, we will do this using the prototype for another automation. But before we talk about that, for everyone who has not seen the last video, here's a quick recap. Over the last years, I had to manually count and package thousands of different screws, nuts and washers for 3D printed parts that I sell online. So I built a machine to do that for me. This video series is about the development of the components using 3D printing, PCB design and some of my personal design theories. The parts travel from the separator via the buffer magazine to the dispenser. Here, they stack up. The production system is intended to be used for various other automations. Basically, we built three kinds of modules in this video series. The modules have all different characteristics. The tube is flexible, the magazine can function as a buffer, and so on. All of them feed screws, nuts, and washers through a sequence of modules. So in this video series, we don't want to build necessarily the most specialized machine for each of those problems, but develop a pool of automation modules that can then be combined flexibly. The example that we will use to show the capabilities of the MPS is a robot that can place screws in printed parts during the printing process. But what can we use that for? Let me explain. This is one of the 3D printed parts that I used to sell online. It is an adapter for this monitor to mount it to wall mount or uh, a monitor arm. For the adapter, we need six screws in total. So to package those six screws, at that time, we took those small plastic bags and counted the screws in there by hand. Using a scale with small quantities of only six pieces per set doesn't really make sense. I mean, you would spend more time pouring the screws onto the scale than counting them by hand. But the counting solution that we built in the last video actually works quite well for that. And this is definitely a pretty good solution. But let's assume we would want to get rid of the manual bag packaging step. To eliminate the need to use plastic bags, we could box the screws in the 3D printed part instead. They are held in place by a small breakout grid. That way the finished part from the printer already includes all the screws. This, at least in theory, shortens the packaging time for us. But how would we then get the screws into the part? Let me explain. 3D printers work by stacking layers of molten material on top of each other. We can pause this at a certain height. Then, while the printer is paused, we insert the screws. And when we now continue printing, the opening gets sealed. When packaging by hand, we mixed two different screw sizes. To simplify this, we can use six identical M4 bolts, which are also definitely more than capable of holding the monitor in place. To automate it, we can build a robot to place the screws in the part. One possibility would be to build a large motion system that would then pick up the screws like a crane and place them in the print. Because we would have a pick and a place operation for each individual part, such a setup is called a pick and place machine. However, it would be quite large and slow and the robot would not know the exact orientation of the screws at the pickup point. For this, we would then have to use something like, for example, image recognition. Instead, we can use the feeder module from the last videos. The screw position in the magazine is exactly defined. And this is where things get really exciting. Now, instead of using our big motion system, we can build a much smaller one that we can stack directly on top of the printer. It has the same footprint as the printer, and instead of feeding each screw individually, we can let gravity do the work for us and place the feeder above the printer. If we now connect the end effector to the magazine via a tube, we can feed the screws fast and easy. There are now two problems that we have to solve. First, the screws that are stacked up in parallel to each other in the magazine must be reoriented so that they can pass through the tube. Second, the robot arm can't be in the 3D printer's range of motion while it's printing. Otherwise, it would collide with the printer. Therefore, we have to find a way to retract the end effector. This is the motion system that we will be using. It sits on top of the printer. I wanted to keep it as low profile as possible, so the printer would still fit on a shelf 
and at the same time keep the range of motion large so we can reach every point on the build plate. The screws feed from the top through this tube and are placed in the exact spot by this arm. The whole thing has a lot of very cool features, but they are much easier to explain when we have the th real thing in front of us. So let's build it. First we have to print a lot of components. Then I cut the linear rails to size and deburr them with the belt sander. The rest of the build primarily involves the correct alignment of the linear rails and bolting together all the 3D printed parts that we printed previously. One thing that you will see a lot in my designs is that I actually like to name the variants. And I call this a T28 coupling. This might sound pointless, but it helps me immensely to model things faster, because I have the exact dimensions for each module in my head, just by thinking about the name. This magnetic coupling gets attached to the tool head, and more about that later in the video. This is the finished motion system. I try to keep the moving mass as low as possible while maintaining a really stiff structure. And before we put it on the printer, let me show you some of the features that I built in. Let's assume you're sitting on, for example, a jet ski and want to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. If your vehicle is not lightweight, you will need a lot of power for that. The same applies here, so to save weight, it's easiest to leave out the heaviest part. Therefore we put the motors on the outside of the frame and pull the tool head with the belt. Because of the way this belt is guided, it's, this is called an H-Bot motion system. This brings speed, and in this case even more important, a smaller footprint, but it leads to a bit of an unintuitive motion. When we turn one motor, the tool head moves diagonally. We need to turn both motors at the same time for a normal Cartesian motion. Each bot allows for a very simple and clean belt routing. That way the belt can run in the slots of the frame. There are definitely other variants that result in even more accurate movement. But since we don't have as high tolerance requirements as for example with 3D printing, I think HBOT is appropriate. To tension the belt, I installed this very cool belt tensioner. It works with a long spring-loaded threaded rod that is hidden inside the aluminium extrusion. To make it useful for potential other applications, we can add a simple magnetic coupling. This allows different tools to be changed quickly manually. Compared to a kinematic coupling, it's definitely overconstrained, but it's cheap, extremely easy to model and quite precise for that. It also serves as an additional safety feature in case I'm doing something stupid, because it simply detaches in case of a crash. Now we still need to find a way to reorient the screws that are stacked up in parallel in the magazine. To do this, I designed this simple part. It is attached to the bottom part of the magazine, and if we now connect the sprocket dispenser from the last video to it, we can see that it actually performs quite well. To better understand how exactly it works, um, I made a section view of it. By slowing it on the clip and going then through it frame by frame, you can see nicely how the screws um, are leaving the magazine almost perfectly parallel. The screw then hits this small chamfer and that results in a small forward motion and a rotation roughly around its center of gravity. To do it that way is only possible because we have pre-positioned each screw really predictable in its accurate magazine position. I know from building the separator that it's really hard to tell with those parts that they really work unless you have tested it on at least 20,000 screws. But the sheer fact that we can cut the thing open, tilt it slightly and it still works is already completely crazy. And it really speaks to the fact that the screws are ejected in a really controlled and repeatable way. Having the screws now in the tube could allow for a lot of great future modules. Um, for example, if we connect pressurized air to the tube, we would not have to rely on gravity anymore. One thing that we have not talked about yet is how the robot knows that the printer is ready, meaning that it has paused the print and it can now start to place the screws. There are many different ways to do this. One option would be to use an MQTT broker, 
that detects via the cloud service to which the printer is connected that the print has been paused at the desired layer height. Okay, now let's test it in action. Since the plane on which the nozzle operates remains constant at the same height, it's enough to cover two positions with the end effector. This way we don't have to add any heavy motors or linear guides to the tool head. Also there's no need to run cables and the whole thing is much smaller and lightweight. Now we have to start the print and wait till it reaches the desired layer height. We can see that while the placement process works okay, the screws should not shower out of the top. So does the whole thing work now? Does it make sense? Yes and no. While the overall motion system works really well, um, the screws unfortunately start to pile up in the pockets. You can see that really well on the webcam footage of the printer. One thing that I also tried was to just place the screws next to each other without using extra walls, but the screws still start to pile up in the pockets. So should we fix this and still use it to get rid of the plastic bags? I think to really use it, the whole redundant motion system thing is a bit impractical. Also, I don't really like that the screws are constantly impacting the build plate each time they are placed. But what I think this thing does really well and that's exactly what it's supposed to do and what I want to do with this video is show possibilities for other applications. I think you could do some really cool stuff with this. I think something like this would really shine in combination with a printer that is already itself capable of tool changing. That way we could use the existing motion system and just build a small tool for the printer. This may not make too much sense just for screws, but just imagine a small tool that you can connect to your 3D printer and that allows you to automatically insert nuts or washers in your print without any extra effort. Of course you could also press fit the parts or insert them by hand, but I strongly believe that there is just a convenience in pushing a button and holding the finished part in your hand afterwards. I think in the end just everyone would love a 3D printer that could print metal contact surfaces and full metal threads without any extra effort. And that's just exactly what it could potentially be. So dear Prusa, I don't know if you're out there and can actually hear me, but I would love to talk about getting a Prusa XL to build an extra tool for this. I know that a video about this feeder unit is long overdue and that will come at some point, but I really want to make videos that are pleasant to watch. And the more complex the modules are, the more difficult it is to make those videos without just cutting out a lot of super cool stuff. And speaking of complexity, just to give a vague idea, this thing was a lot of work and it took me over a week to build. but. With this, I don't really know, it's hard to tell. I think I spent over two years building it. And there are just so many design decisions inherent in it, and I really want to present them properly. And for that, I just need a bit more time to practice doing videos. Another question that was raised is about the design release. And I like to build things that are useful. So that means that I also want people to use it. So accordingly, at some point, there will be some form of a release. I have not at all decided yet how that's going to take place and what's going to be released and what way it's going to happen because right now I'm really trying to focus on finishing the whole production system. I really want this thing to be done and 100% reliable because I really believe that reliability is the most important thing in automation. In the next videos we will focus again more on the actual feeding system. Also we still need to finish the sprocket module. If you want to see me build those prototypes then hit the subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.